CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Later, we're going to be joined by Greg Tranter, author of The Buffalo Sports Curse, 120 Years of Pain, Disappointment, Heartbreak, and Eternal Optimism. And you may know Greg Tranter's work uh, from the Buffalo History Museum, where uh, he has the world's largest uh, collection of Buffalo Bills uh, memorabilia, which he's collected his entire life, much of which is on display over at the Buffalo History Museum. Highly recommend you go over there and check that out. It's a great place. And um, the Buffalo History Museum, I wouldn't call it a hidden gem, but I'll bet you it's an underutilized gem uh, because every time I go over there to do research or have an event, sometimes I'm uh, asked to go over there and, and do a speaking engagement or something like that. It is an impressive building. Impressive location, but also just uh, incredible stuff. There, are you ever go over to the museum, Jonah? I have been there once or twice, and I would say it is a bit hidden, kind of being inside another museum and not as a in a more prominent sporting location, maybe at the arena or near the sporting center of Western New York. Well, I mean the Buffalo History Museum, the whole thing, the the build. I mean, have you you ever gone over there to do research? Which is also. Uh, when I did the Roger Goodell story, for instance, and I wanted to do the uh, history of Goodell Avenue um, or Goodell Street, whichever it is there in Buffalo, and if it really was uh, a relation of Roger Goodell, uh, I went and did uh, went back and through the Buffalo City uh, archives and things like that. And the stuff that they have over there is um, is incredible. You ever well, maybe I'm like that? I thought there? it was a uh, wing inside of the Buffalo Historical Museum. It is. The oh. sports part. I'm talking about just the Buffalo History Museum, period. Well, it's a wonderful place. <laughs> but I mean, it is a little bit of a hidden gem because you have to know it's inside of another museum and it's a little bit tucked, you know, off the 33 in East Buffalo. It's, it's not down at the arena or with a big sign on the outside that says, come visit the Buffalo Sports Museum. You have to know where it is before you can actually kind of get to it and visit it and walk around. Yes. But it's yes, it's pretty cool. Um, are the Bills history? Are the 2022 Bills history? They're in third place in the AFC East, Jonah, with seven games left. Josh Allen has played poorly for 10 quarters. And uh, you have the floor. I would not say that. I mean, they're in the hunt or, or they're in the playoff picture. They're, they're not in the, in the hunt, hunt those, which is uh, those those words that go right along there with the Buffalo sports curse, right in the hunt. Yeah. they're right. I think there the bills are better than in the hunt. And they're probably going to make the playoffs, which is <laughs> right. They're thing. probably, um, are they, should they still be considered super bowl favorites? Well, yes. In the sense that, you know, I think in any professional sport, especially the NFL, there's probably six to eight teams that are good enough to win the championship. And I think the bills are in that mix, maybe not, to where they were at the beginning of the season or where some Bills fans have perceived them to be throughout the year in the offseason as the Super Bowl favorite and the unquestioned number one contender and the best team in the league and planning the parade months and months in advance. I think you're seeing, one, that there are ways that this season can go off track for the Bills and also that there are other good teams. The Minnesota Vikings came into the game with a better record and came out of the game with a better record by two victories than the Bills. I don't know if they're a better team, but you find that there are many other teams in the league that are good. And, and something stuck with me that Justin Jefferson said in his post-game press conference, because the, the narrative around the Vikings was that they had built their record by beating uh, weaker teams and, and had a softer schedule, and they were very proud of themselves having beaten a team like the Bills that was considered one of the best in the league and a Super Bowl contender. But Justin Jefferson wanted to remind us that in the NFL – Nobody sucks. That was his quote. And I think that's an interesting perspective to have and in that even the teams that 
you know, the Bills are favored by 12, 14 points against and really should beat nine or 10 times out of 10 are still NFL teams with good NFL players that if you don't play well and execute well and scheme well and take care of business that you can lose against almost any team in the NFL. And especially the Bills with the injuries they're facing on defense and Josh Allen playing through an injury and maybe, uh, you know, mentally and timing and confidence and rhythm wise, not being at his best, that as good as the Bills roster is, you can't expect the Bills to win every single week when they are not at their best and being their best selves. And I think we saw that in this game when, oh, by the way, for about three quarters, they dominated that game and really looked like they were uh, a Super Bowl favorite team until things started to slip away. You're going to lose games and great teams lose two in a row also. Um, However, I think it's the way that the Bills lost the games and in particular, Josh Allen's performances, because he's the guy who's supposed to cover up the mistakes made by others. He's the one who's supposed to pull you through uh, Cam Lewis, not batting the ball down uh, on fourth and forever uh, and allowing Justin Jefferson to make that miraculous catch. Um, he's supposed to be able to cover up a bad officiating call, although the Bills got a couple of gifts. Uh, I don't think that uh, Bills fans can complain uh, about the officials after what happened at the end of that game uh, with 12 men on the field uh, when uh, I think it was first and goal, right? Or was it second and goal? Either way, it was a three-yard loss uh, in which um, uh, the Bills had 12 defenders on the field. Uh, the Gabriel Davis catch along the sideline, which should have been wiped out, but wasn't. So the Bills caught some breaks. Uh, but Josh Allen is supposed to be, you know, cover up those blemishes uh, that happened to go the other way. And he has just been adding to the hardship and it's the critical errors. It's his first NFL game, which it's amazing to think because as a rookie, he could be reckless at times. And we saw hero ball be a thing for him for the first couple of years of his career, but it was the first game on Sunday in which Josh Allen had thrown two red zone interceptions. Uh, he has now, uh, had, uh, for the first time in his career in uh, against the Green Bay Packers, he threw uh, two fourth quarter interceptions. And then he threw one in the fourth quarter and one in overtime uh, against the Vikings. So that's twice in three games he's done something that he'd never before done in his career, not even as a reckless rookie. Um, he's obviously the fumbles, uh, two strip sacks against the Jets. He lost the fumble. Uh, in the end zone, a, a critical error that led to a Vikings uh, touchdown. So I think that when you see a team lose a game, a heartbreaker, a close one, uh, the ball bounces the wrong direction, um, you, and you want to chalk it up to bad luck, that's one thing. But to see your franchise quarterback, who is supposed to be the guy to pull you through the tough times, uh, actually being uh, the most the biggest cause of the rough times uh, is what has uh, Bill's fans worried because um, you only need to be able or you only uh, need to have one off performance in the postseason uh, and you don't even get to the Super Bowl, let alone win it. And as it stands right now, uh, the Bills may not get that first round by. Uh, that was one of the safer bets on the board heading into the season. I think if people looked at it and thought, well, the Bills are the Super Bowl favorites, they're going to win the AFC East clean against a rebuilding Jets, against a rebuilding Patriots, uh, against a Dolphins team that seems to be imploding uh, as a franchise with the owner being suspended and losing draft picks and not getting the coach they want, and not getting the quarterback they want, and the Brian Flores lawsuit and and then it seems as though everybody in the AFC East has come to come to compete for the division title this year. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, there are a lot more variables being added to the Bills plate as we uh, are halfway through November. Uh, this is when things are supposed to be settling down a little bit. And now new questions seem to be popping up. Well, and from the our perspective as you know, neutral objective media people. You know, that's a good thing. It's making it more interesting than just blowouts and waiting until the season ends and believing that really nothing matters until they play the Chiefs in the AFC Championship game and uh, moving on from there 
as far as Josh Allen, I do think it's interesting. You know, it wasn't until very late last season he had never thrown an interception in the red zone in his career and had a very long streak of uh, red zone trips where he didn't turn the ball over and was, you know, even the mistakes that he would make in the middle of the field didn't seem to apply when they got close to the end zone. And now I, if it hasn't been five straight games, it's been five times this season, he's thrown in a red zone interception. I don't know if there's something that defenses are seeing in the, the way he plays down there, the plays that they're running or, or the pl- the change in the play call or the change in the offensive scheme with going from Brian Dabel to Ken Dorsey. That's, leading to more uh, interceptable plays. Uh, perhaps the injury w- was a factor in some of the throws that maybe Josh Allen with a healthy elbow uh, gets to the receiver and with a somewhat weakened elbow, the ball doesn't have the same accuracy or zip on it. Although he looked, throwing the ball looked like Josh Allen. It didn't seem like that injury affected him in any way and, and didn't seem to affect him from uh, running people over and trying to make tackles and being very physical. It didn't seem like he was favoring that injury in any way, but I, I don't know. It makes it a more interesting season that the bills have to fight from underneath a little bit. I always kind of think they're at their best when they perceive themselves to be counted out, or they think that the media or the rest of the league doesn't believe that they're a great team and they have to go out and prove that. And that in a front running status that they had to do that all year long, that maybe, uh, the adversity would come in the postseason, and they weren't quite uh, not ready for it. But you know, you have to practice winning close games and winning when you're not at your best, and overcoming these different elements, so that if it happens again in the postseason, you know you can draw on that recent experience of this is how we did it in week eleven or week whatever it is. So I think it's good that the Bills aren't having an easy ride through the regular season, as long as they maybe find themselves and are at their best and also at their healthiest late in the season, because I don't really think they can win a Super Bowl with this many defensive starters not playing. So they need to, and there's not, not much you can do about it. You can really only hope that they are healthier when the playoffs roll around. But I do think that's maybe the big storyline with this team is that uh, how many key players are injured and, and whether those are going to be permanent injuries or injuries they can overcome. Here's another part of the storyline that has been overlooked, and I I don't think it's a crime that it's been overlooked because what's wrong with Josh Allen is clearly the overarching uh, theme. Uh, And then you also have the injury aspect of it. When's Tredavious White coming back? Um, All the injuries writ large uh, are are big, uh, regardless of whether it's Poyer or Edmonds or anybody else. Uh, Getting healthy is critical. Uh, the play calling uh, has been uh, under fire since Sunday. Um, I can see reasons for that. The four-minute offense in particular, uh, with, I believe, four and a half minutes left in regulation, the Bills get the ball back and run once, commit a false start, throw two incomplete passes, uh, one of which was dropped by Stephon Diggs, which you don't see very often, probably one of the best, not probably one of the best, Clearly one of the best, maybe the absolute best contested catch receivers in the NFL. Well, now I'm thinking about that again, because Justin Jefferson may have taken over <laughs> that role too. Anyways, I'm going to stop they trying to talk the myself. They all have I'm the sorry. Same gloves. They all have the same gloves. <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, Stefan Diggs is great at the, st- at the contested catch did not make it there in that four minute offense, but the bills take one minute off the clock. Do not force the Vikings to take their time out. It's still the two-minute warning ahead. Uh, So that was a bad stretch where the Bills uh, just did nothing with a possession where they're supposed to run out the clock uh, or at least come close to putting a a big dent in it. Uh, But And not kicking the field goal before that. uh, Right. Well, but but, yeah, right. right, right, But I want to stay on, on this point is this what I thought was over has been overlooked for the past couple of days were the words uh, that uh, Sean McDermott had to say about the run game. And he didn't say a lot, but I think we're inching towards that public criticism like we had uh, from Sean McDermott to Brian Dable about not running the ball enough. And he's talking about needing to run the ball when the weather gets bad. Uh, He used the phrase that uh, the running game or the play call balance got out of whack in the second half after for the second or third straight game. I don't know what it's been. Devin Singletary having a a fantastic first half. And then 
in the second half, the run game disappears with the exception of Josh Allen. Um, so I do think that Sean McDermott uh, is, is uh, inching towards that uh, insistence that uh, the Bills run more. And that might not be the, the worst thing. Uh, we, we, we can go back to the, the game last year against the Atlanta Falcons. Josh Allen had a bad day, uh, and he just wasn't able to complete passes. He wasn't able to get into a rhythm. So what happened? The Bills just ran the ball for the rest of the game. Uh, Josh Allen included Devin Singletary, and they just pounded out a victory over the Atlanta Falcons on a day where Josh Allen just didn't have it. Well, it's been a couple of weeks where Josh Allen hasn't had it. And uh, so going towards the run game against the Browns uh, or the week after that against Detroit might not be uh, the worst bit of strategy Sean McDermott can come up with. However, I think it's just interesting to note uh, that he seems to be getting a little frustrated with Ken Dorsey's inability to get that part of the game going. Well, yeah, and it seemed like a game where they were going to rely more on the running game and less on Josh Allen. Josh Allen doesn't warm up, at least publicly, in front of the fans uh, on the field like he normally does. They have six running backs active, although it seemed a lot of that was special teams related, but it seemed like ooh, maybe this team might uh, be a run-oriented team today with all of these running backs in, in the active lineup. And they started out running the ball well. It just seemed like when they got the lead, when it started to look like Josh Allen was not affected by the injury, he was throwing the ball well, they were moving the ball, that they got back to their normal play of offense and, and away from the running game. And maybe that's something that Minnesota did defensively to counteract the early runs that were successful. And a lot of the NFL is looking at the defense and calling your plays to react to how they're aligned and schemed on the defensive side of things but yeah it does seem it, it is kind of Sean McDermott's nature when the Bills lose to find a scapegoat and either blame somebody on the offensive side coaching the football it's happened going back to his first year with Bench and Tyrod Taylor and at various points last year with maybe some of these cold wars that were had with Brian Dable so you know maybe that's going on or maybe that's just kind of the knee-jerk response to every time the Bills lose um, to blame the offensive coordinator and the offensive coaching. You mentioned the field goal. I, I don't know that it was the wrong decision to go for it on fourth down. It was unsuccessful. I guess on one hand, you can say it's the wrong decision because it didn't work, but uh, I don't mind the bills going for it there um, in general, but it really did cost them. I mean, that extra field goal would have helped, especially when you're going up against uh, a kicker, uh, on the Viking side, uh, who is far from automatic. And so three points uh, is incredibly valuable uh, when the other team is going to need to score touchdowns and can't just kick their way out of, uh, kick their way into uh, keeping pace, I guess I should say. Um, what was it? Uh, what was it like in the press box? Were there, were there, what was the uh, what was the armchair quarterbacking like in the press box when the Bills decided to go for it there? Well, you know where I sit in the press box, in between Sal Mayorana and John Waro. So <laughs> right. you can imagine they did not agree with the decision. Um, and, and it was it was spoken about by, I think, many people in the press box that the Bills should kick the field goal here. They would give them a 13-point lead, and it would force the Vikings to score two touchdowns in the last, I think, you know, 10-46 or whatever that was. And I'm... You know, I, I agree with the, I, I know the analytics and I understand how being aggressive on fourth down is beneficial in the long run and in the aggregate. But you watch these games and you oftentimes think just take the points and especially the Bills have a very reliable kicker. Now, maybe they missed that field goal and it is no better of a situation. I think it and would also, have been a 25 yarder. Yeah, well, so he probably doesn't miss the field goal, but maybe he hits the upright like, uh, you know, the Minnesota kicker did on the extra point coming down, which was another break that could have worked in the Bills favor. The Bills. As much as you think they maybe got cursed in that game, they also had a lot of things. You mentioned that earlier. A lot of things go in their favor. I think another thing that really hurt the Bills on that play is uh, just throwing an incomplete pass would have been a lot better than throwing an interception. That was Oh, absolutely. I think that's a big part of that arithmetic uh, that goes into that decision is the fact that if you don't get it, the Vikings are starting off on their seven-yard line. Uh, when you throw that interception – uh, at least it's going to be at the 20 Patrick Peterson decides to run it out and makes a fantastic return. And I think got to the 34. So that changes the calculus quite a bit when you throw the interception 
uh, yeah, you need to throw an incomplete pass in that situation and make the Vikings go 93 yards instead of 66, I think. And they went that 66 very slowly. They were pretty meticulous on that particular drive. They did not hurry it up. Uh, so if they're taking the same approach from 93 yards away, um, then that's a huge drain off the clock. Um, but yeah, we can talk about all the different things, uh, a break here or there, a drop, um, Cam Lewis not batting the ball down. There are all kinds of different ways the Bills could have won the game. Uh, but again, and I, I hate to uh, uh, repeat myself, but I think that's the, the beauty of having a quarterback like Josh Allen is he's supposed to cover up those other miscues. That's why he has that contract that he does. That's why the quarterback position is the most important in all of sports. And he just hasn't been there. He hasn't been that guy. And, um, and I think that uh, he's the type of personality that his team still believes in him. I don't think that confidence is shook in Josh Allen right now with the leader that he is, the, the type A personality, the alpha male. Um, but uh, it can't, that, that isn't invincible. It's not impenetrable that he can get into a situation where um, that, that, that confidence uh, starts to show a little a crack or um, he gets down on himself. And, and we're seeing some of that confidence of trying to do it all. You know, maybe if he had recognized that he wasn't at his best and not trying to win the game and put it all on his shoulders, it would have came out better. Well, I think that that's where he gets into some trouble and I'll see if I can pull them up uh, quickly enough here. But you saw the close ups uh, on the Fox Sports uh, broadcast. Um, Hang on one second, but the the close ups of his face, of that smile, that grin, um, him he he was feeling it uh, through three quarters, and I'm looking for the stats here. He was. Well, while you're looking it up, let me raise one point. Oh, here we go. No, I got it. I got it. So he was 14 of 18 for 134 yards and a touchdown. Um, that was through the first half. And then he had a, an effective third quarter also. Uh, and so he, he it was, um, I think he was thinking, uh, you know, everybody counted me out and every, everybody thought I wasn't going to even play this week. People were talking about me needing elbow surgery. Oh, here we go. Through three quarters, 19 of 25 for 215 and a touchdown. And he'd also run three times for 46 yards. That's Superhero Josh Allen doing it. And I think the part, how can you not feel like I'm unstoppable, bitches? Uh, and here we go. And sometimes I think he needs to, to keep that in check. I'm not 100% sure that that's what's going through his head, but it would be hard not to for any human being. You know, I recall uh, the story that I did on him before the season, in which I called him uh, maybe the NFL's uh, ultimate weapon of all time. You know, it's a story that took a look at Josh Allen as an all-time great quarterback, not just right now, but what he needs to do. And Kurt Warner's words were, what is going to take him to the next step, because he still has room to grow, is going to be his ability to, to make the layup, to take the layup and make it, uh, and to see the, the play and to do the smart play, not just the spectacular play, but to get some wisdom. Uh, added on to his game. And he did not look like he had a lot of wisdom uh, in the fourth quarter on Sunday, nor did he play with a lot of wisdom in the second half against the Jets or in the second half against the Green Bay Packers. And even though it didn't burn him, the wisdom to slide or step out of bounds or throw the ball away sometimes and not make every play uh, a do or die, you know, physical contest. Not lead with his injured elbow when trying to make a tackle. Not as you mentioned uh, off the air, pounding the turf in disgust with his injured arm. Um, you know, here, here's the we've all seen it before. You know, there's that uh, uh, that uh, that analogy or metaphor that that's going that goes around on social media about Josh Allen is the big goofy golden retriever. I'm sure you've yeah, seen that yeah. on social media. Well, sometimes the big goofy role, uh, golden retriever goes out in the backyard and rolls around in rabbit shit. Uh, you know, that's dogs do that. You know, it's like, ah, oh, there's my goofy boy. Come on, get in the house. Ah, oh, God damn it. Now I, 
<laughs> I got to give you a bath. Uh, I got to stop, stop eating that rabbit shit. Stop it. You know, and then you, you got to yell at the dog sometimes for doing something stupid. Well, that's your big, goofy golden retriever. Uh, he's he's going to have days like that. Well, and one thing, and it's easy to say now after the Bills lost the game and the way it played out, but and I felt this way a little bit going into the game. I think in the grand scheme of things, there was a lot of worry and consternation about whether Josh Allen couldn't play and, and would the Bills season be derailed by having to play however many games without their superstar quarterback. But it might have been good for the Bills to try to win a game with Case Keenum at quarterback to see if they can do it with a more, you know, ground oriented attack or a more rely on the defense or a more conservative passing game, because you are going to need all of the other players on the team and need to win in different styles. There might be a weather game or something in the playoffs where Josh Allen can't make all the throws and can't make all of the plays. I mean, we saw that in the Monday night game last year and it just might, it, all the times that the bills won with Frank Reich at quarterback instead of Jim Kelly, you kind of need that pitch in your arsenal to be able to rely on your superstar quarterback when that's how you win the game, but to also win when either your superstar quarterback is not at his best or not in the lineup and maybe being forced to play a game or two with Case Keenum at quarterback, the bills would have discovered something in their team and in themselves that they don't need Josh Allen at his best to win games. And that would help them overall in the long run. Yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, that'll never happen. I mean, this isn't hockey where you can uh, tell your guy he's going to watch from the press box tonight because you have 82 games. Um, although but the Bills have kind of them for the health reasons, could have said right. Hey, the Bills have done out. that on the defensive side. I think there have been occasions where somebody could have played and the Bills held them out for a game. Uh, doing it right they, now with Tre'Davious White. Well, maybe. Think. Although you know, Sean McDermott seems to be saying he's not still not not comfortable yet on the, on the knee. It could be a mental thing. I don't know. We don't know. And that's the thing, you know, Sean McDermott is that way with injuries. I'm not bitching about it, uh, but we really don't know. We don't, we, we have, we really don't know about Josh Allen's elbow. We really don't uh, how bad it was, how bad it wasn't. Is he risking anything? Is he, we don't know. Uh, we're assuming not because that, that would be reason to, uh, to scrutinize uh, and and to wonder how if, if that's being careless with with a um, with a very delicate part of the body uh, for a quarterback his throwing elbow, uh, but we really don't know if how her, whether it, it maybe it's fine maybe it was just a bruise I don't know we don't well we did see who's to say he, it seemed to be just judging by the way he threw the ball and and watching the football that it didn't really affect his throwing ability you didn't see him wincing or clutching his elbow very often, maybe uh, the brace and, and different things that they did pregame prevented that. But as you mentioned in our podcast on Saturday night, a lot of that UCL injury comes into play down the arm and the thumb and the grip and, and the ability to, you know, control the hand and, and hold on to the football. And maybe that came into play on that fumble on the goal line and not really you know, I took being a, able to grab the ball. Thad Brown from channel eight in Rochester had a great angle on that. Uh, and he posted it yesterday and it looked as though it had hit the fingers and he was, it was, I think Josh Allen trying to run before he had the ball. He was, he was just too excited to, to make sure he got a good push uh, to get out of the end zone. So really close up. Look, it looked like it hit, it hit his fingers. Um, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a grip thing, but I'm sure it didn't help. Or is it, is it even on his mind? You know, I need to, take the snap. I need to protect my shoulder or I need to protect my elbow. I need to burrow forward. I need to take this step for, you know, there's all kinds of things that are unnatural about that snap compared to all the thousands upon thousands of other snaps he's taken directly from, from center. You're, you're trained as a quarterback. You're all your drills. You're, you take the snap and you're you snap and you're going back. Uh, and the footwork is just ingrained way more uh, in, in backpedaling than it is in moving forward. So you do have to think about it uh, as you're putting your hands uh, under Mitch Morris's uh, undercarriage there. Uh, and as, as Eric Wood has said, I've had the discussion with Eric Wood before, and um, I can't remember where it was. I don't even know if it was on this podcast or if we were just shooting the shit one day in the press box before the game. And he was talking about how 
um, that is the most difficult snap a center can make because it's so it, there's just so many different elements to it of the, the, the defense is right on top of you, multiple guys, you know, you're going to get crushed as soon as you snap the ball. Um, you know, the quarterback is running up, up behind you. You know, there's all kinds of different elements to it that, that just, that change your, your mental trajectory just enough, uh, for these little things to happen. It definitely was a golden retriever moment that uh, Josh Allen was so excited and determined and eager to get that ball and get it out of the end zone and not take the safety when really the safety wouldn't have been as bad as I, I guess it's obvious, but you take that safety, you kick the ball all the way down the field and they don't have very much time with one timeout to drive down and get that go ahead touchdown. Uh, you just got to know in that situation that a safety is not good, but it's not as bad as the fumble. So you make sure you secure that snap and then go from there. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, very good point by you, Tim. I do want to make one kind of plea to the Bills fans and people reacting to that game and this kind of so much about uh, whether this is going to be a Super Bowl championship season because the long season, a lot of things are going to happen, good and bad, between now and then. And we talked about this in the preseason, even as the Far and away Super Bowl favorites, what does that give the Bills? A one in six, a one in eight chance of being the Super Bowl champion. So it's more likely than not that the Bills are not going to win the Super Bowl. And I don't think the expectations can be Super Bowl championship or bust. I think you have to appreciate that this is a good competitive team that's going to be, it's going to play entertaining games and competitive games. And, and when they do lose, it's probably going to come down to the last play and that they're going to be in the playoffs and they're going to be a team that's competing for a championship. And then that should be celebrated and appreciated and you take the wins with the losses. And if you only put all of the expectations on this team has to win the championship, it has to break the Buffalo sports curse and anything that happens that's not moving towards that goal is another example of us be of Western New York being cursed is just going to set yourself up for disappointment and also not really appreciating the moment. If the bills do win the championship, that if you make that an expectation, it might not feel as good as you think it's going to be. If the Bills do win that Super Bowl championship, you kind of want it to be a pinch yourself moment. I can't believe it happened. It's so unbelievable. I never thought it would happen. And now is a time to maybe get yourself in that mindset of, you know, maybe they don't win the Super Bowl or I don't know if they will. And then if they do, well, wow, that would be such a wonderful thing that happens because you never thought it would, could be possible. Do you think it's, uh, if, if not the, the other side of that, Jonah is, uh, the fan, uh, just being relieved and not enjoying is, do you think that's the alternative? Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I don't quite understand. Meaning, I, I think that's like the, you say, the mindset you should be in. Right. But, but what's the alternative? What do you think they're, they're tracking towards if this advice you're giving, what do you think? What's the alternative? If they, if they don't take your advice, then what? Well, I think the alternative is that it's going to be, you're not going to appreciate how good this team was and how good this season is if they happen to lose in the AFC championship game or lose in the playoffs. I, I mean, I don't know. I guess maybe I'm thinking back to last season. They had that great, memorable wildcard win against the Patriots that in some ways it seems like one of the greatest moments in Bill's history. They go play one of the greatest games in NFL history the next week, but because they didn't, uh, you know, make that stop against the Chiefs and they allowed them to score in those 13 seconds, that's pretty much all anybody remembers from last season now. And I think there's some potential to, uh, with all the great things that are happening and all the, the fun elements of this season, that it'll be a disappointment if the Bills don't win the championship or if they go to the Super Bowl and lose. I mean, we look back now, 30, however many years later, and it's a great moment in Buffalo sports history that the Bills went to four Super Bowls, but they didn't win any of those championships. I guess I just, winning the Super Bowl and breaking the curse can't be the only goal and function of the season. I, I don't believe in any sports where they say this, that our only existence is to win the championship. I don't really think that's the case. I think the existence is to be a good and competitive and you know, team that competes for championships. And I think the main goal should be to get home field advantage for as many games as you can and have home playoff games and have 
memorable games and memorable experiences. And if that winds up in being the champion at the end of the season, that's wonderful. And if it doesn't, that's still good and okay. As long as you're not down at the bottom of the league and missing the playoffs for 17 straight seasons, because, uh, you know, it could be a lot worse than losing a game to the Vikings. That was maybe the game of the year. Uh, the goal is to be entertaining. And uh, that leads us right into uh, the next topic, the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, they've lost how many in a row? Six in a row? Five, five. Five in a row. Um, they still are entertaining to me. Uh, I'm, I'm still enjoying them. I know they're not winning like they did early in the season. And, and, I, and some uh, folks that I talked to are already feeling burned, uh, feeling like they uh, foolish for uh, getting too excited uh, in October about how the Sabres looked. But I, I still see a pretty entertaining team. The goaltending's not there, but um, some of these young players are, are doing exciting things. I've, obviously, Rasmus Dahlin's a, a lot of fun to watch. And uh, Tage Thompson seems to be able to score whenever he wants. And um, anyways, uh, you're, you're out there at the arena a lot more than I am, Jonah. What are your, your thoughts on the Sabres and, and is anything changed or is it just, uh, you know, puck luck? What, what are we talking about here with the, with where the Sabres are? I think there's a lot of things going on. You know, I didn't go to the game Saturday night cause I went to watch, uh, a great game between Canisius and St. Bonaventure that went to overtime and was competitive and entertaining, even though maybe some Bonner fans are sad that the end result wasn't in their favor. But from what I understand, from what I read and kind of heard people talking about in the Bills press box the next day, the Sabres played pretty well and they, they held their own against the best team in the Eastern Conference. And even though they didn't win the game or they didn't get to overtime and get a point, that it was a sign that this is a better team and that it was tied with game, like eight eight or 10 minutes left. The game was tied and uh, it gave the impression that the, the Sabres might steal a couple of points. Right. And even though they're still on a five game skid, it was a move in the right direction from the Vegas loss where they weren't quite as competitive and the Arizona loss, which is really a game they should have won. And, and of all of these losses they've had in the last five games, that's the one I think you're later in the season, you really look back at and think the Sabres should have gotten a point or two out of that game. And maybe if they miss the playoffs by a point or two, you're looking at games like that and thinking that's where they, they messed up. So, and they got a game tonight against the Vancouver Canucks closing out this homestand. And I think you really need to uh, get a win and the, and the losing streak, not have to go onto a road trip. And I think they have a back-to-back -back coming up after that and not have to, or they play the next, they play tomorrow night in Ottawa. So I think you really need to get a win tonight. Uh, in order to right the ship a little bit and get some belief and confidence and good feeling because it, it could be tough to get win that game tomorrow coming off a of back-to-back -back on the road uh, on a six-game losing streak. So it's very important, I think, to end the losing streak, even though I don't think having lost these last five games is a terribly dire situation as long as they can break through and get some things going. They have a big game in Toronto on Saturday night. Um, so, yeah, it's a season. As much as it's going on with the Bills, there's going to be ebbs and flows and ups and downs, especially with the Sabres not being quite as uh, dominant and competitive a team as the Bills. There's going to be moments in this year where uh, the team doesn't play well and looks like, uh, you know, it's not going to make the playoffs. And hopefully there's moments when they get it going and do look like a playoff team. A lot happens in a month, but uh, the Sabres handled the Canucks pretty well in Vancouver uh, earlier in the season. So it's a team that uh, clearly is beatable, especially when they're the ones traveling eastward uh, on their road trip. Um, quick run around the big four, Jonah. You mentioned that uh, St. Bonaventure Canisius game. It's classic Reggie Witherspoon. Um he really does well against the local teams and he seems to have some kind of magic, whether he's playing UB or obviously in this case, St. Bonaventure at Kessler athletic center. And um, uh, again, uh, we've talked about it before too. I mean, the, the Kessler is not the uh, not exactly the greatest place uh, to watch a game, the energy level and the, the atmosphere, not that great regularly, uh, but with St. Bonaventure playing there, it had to have been uh, a pretty frenetic scene uh, there with Canisius pulling that one out. Oh, it absolutely was. And for a gym that, I mean, the attendance figure was 1,900, which isn't a lot. You know, if there were 1,900 at the Sabres game, we'd be 
you know, wonder, you know, there'd be nobody there. But in that small gym, 1900 can get pretty loud. And Reggie Witherspoon made a great point after the game that I didn't really think of, but how different it is. You know, you don't have too many college basketball environments where it's a split crowd, where the, the crowd is cheering on baskets on both ends and, and the other team scores and you feel that energy from the crowd. And you feel like it's you like a conference back. tournament energy. Yeah. Well, he compared it to a high school game in that, and that changes a player's kind of emotional state and attitude in the game. When the other team scores and you hear the crowd cheering, especially in your home gym, when you hear fans cheering against you, uh, when the other team scores, you feel like you want to get the ball and run down and score right again. And that can, and maybe that's not the best basketball play to make. And he prepared his team and some of his veteran players for this is what it's going to be like. It's, you know, there's going to be a lot of Bonaventure fans here, maybe even more than Kanisha's fans. And there's also going to be a lot of our fans here cheering and trying to match that energy and sound. Cause it was maybe a 60% Bonna crowd, but from the noise and the energy, it was more 50%. Cause I think those Kanisha's fans really tried to match uh, the cheering and the energy level. And that one, it made a great atmosphere in a game where no team led by more than six points in regulation. And there were, if I remember this right, 14 lead changes and nine ties. It was a back and forth game all the way through until Canisius pulled away early in overtime. And I think that the Canisius team, one, was ready for what the crowd was going to be like and the energy level. And this Bonnet team, that's all new players and has never played in the Kessler Center before any of these players. And it wasn't really aware of maybe what that environment would be like and, and didn't really know that Canisius would come out and probably play better than what they saw on film in that game. And also, I think just having a big energetic crowd, even if a lot of those fans were cheering for the other team, the Canisius players fed off that because that gym's empty a lot and doesn't have a lot of energy in the building. And I think just feeling like it was a big game and a big moment brought out some of the best in the Canisius players. And that's what we've seen over the years. Last year, they beat uh, UB down at the arena. And the year before that, or a couple of years before that, they beat Bonaventure in the arena. And a few years before that, they had a big win over UB. A, a lot of these are happening at the arena. But there was an overtime win at the Riley Center in uh, Reggie Witherspoon's first year at Canisius when uh, Bonaventure was a very good team that season. The Canisius players who don't always have big games and energy in the building seem to rise to the occasion when there is a game with that type of crowd and that kind of atmosphere. And I think that has something to do with Reggie Witherspoon preparing them for it. And he said he spent the week uh, talking to them about Bob Lanier and Tim Wynn and the Little Three history and Canisius and St. Bonaventure. And I think he got them up for this being a really big game on the schedule. And not that Bonaventure didn't do any of that, but they probably didn't approach this game as any more than just a game on the schedule where Canisius is at a point in their program where when they play Buffalo or they play St. Bonaventure, uh, it's bigger than the other games, and, and oftentimes they rise to the occasion. Yeah, Reggie Witherspoon seems to be a master at that. Uh, I'd, I'd be curious to know what his record is against uh, other big four schools going back to even his time at UB. Um, they haven't done well against Niagara. That's kind of the weird thing. They, they, they tend to split the Bana ub games most of these seasons with Reggie Witherspoon. There's a couple where they haven't, and then they're not very good against Niagara, which – should be a bigger game. That's a conference game, and they play it twice a year, and there's that same energy in the building. But that's been a tough matchup for Canisius during Reggie Witherspoon's time at, at Canisius. All right, Jonah, we'll get to some other things um, in our next episode later this week. But uh, let's take a break and then bring in uh, Greg Tranter from the Buffalo History Museum to talk about his book um, right after these words. The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716 716- 630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome back to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. As promised, we are joined now by Greg Tranter. And uh, quite the resume and qualifications I need to... Uh, 
I need to get everybody caught up on. Now, the most important thing is that Greg Tranter is the author of The Buffalo Sports Curse, 120 Years of Pain, Disappointment, Heartbreak, and Eternal Optimism. And uh, that's available on RIT Press. And uh, Greg is actually going to be having a book signing from 11.30 a.m. till 4.30 p.m. at RIT uh, on Wednesday. Uh, So again, Wednesday from 11.30 to 4.30. It's a book signing and holiday event with all the authors uh, for all the RIT books that were published this year. Uh, Greg is the president of the board of managers of the Buffalo History Museum and is a very active member of the Pro Football Researchers Association. Greg, thanks for joining us. Uh, We we were uh, planning this for a week or two. But how appropriate that it finally happens uh, right after Sunday's game against the Vikings. Uh, The Buffalo sports curse clearly uh, still still very much uh, influencing what's happening on the football field. Greg, thanks for this. Hey, thank you, Tim. I appreciate it uh, being able to join you and Jonah today. Well, your your thoughts. uh, Let's just get uh, your fresh thoughts as a Bills fan, such a Bills fan, in fact that the Greg T the Greg D Tranter collection at the Buffalo history museum, the largest collection of bills, items, and uh, memorabilia anywhere in the world. And uh, much of it is on display at the Buffalo history museum, 7,500 objects, documents, uh, game worn stuff, so much stuff. So anyway, maybe the ultimate bills fan here, how did Sunday's game leave you feeling? Uh, (laughs) that the curse isn't over yet. (laughs) Um, you know, especially when you go back and think about some of the things that happened on Sunday, um, you know, fumbling the ball at the goal line when the game was over, all we had to do was get out of the end zone. Um, and even we could have even taken a safety and still potentially won the game. Um, it just seems so Buffalo. And then that's, I was reading the other day. That's only the second time since the merger that a defensive touchdown was scored in the final minute to put the other team ahead. Um, so what does that tell you? Well, I wasn't aware of that. I hadn't seen that stat. There are so many stats, uh, unfortunate stats coming out of that game that I must have missed that one. So, yeah, they, they found a new way to lose or an, yeah. almost, an almost unique way to lose. Yes, for sure. So, but, but you know, I was, I was actually hopeful um, a few weeks ago, and I still am, But when the book first came out, I got my first copy the day before the Chiefs game. And I was looking at it that Sunday morning. And when I watched the Chiefs game on TV, I put the book right next to me while I watched the game. And of course, we came from behind and won. And I go, hey, that's got to be a good omen, right? (laughs) (laughs) But when did the book go on sale? Maybe that's the the thing people need to uh, mark this with the milestone. Are they 0 and 2 since the book went on sale? No, no, it came out or before I'm sorry. the Green Bay game. Okay, so, so they're uh, 1 and 2. It came out during the bye week. So they're 1 and 2. <laughs> um, since. And let me give the name of the book again and I'll obviously repeat it a handful of times, but it's The Buffalo Sports Curse: 120 Years of Pain, Disappointment, Heartbreak, and Eternal Optimism. So it's not dead yet. Uh, but what was the inspiration for this book? Was there any one moment uh, within your <laughs> Buffalo fandom where you thought, okay, a book needs to be written? Uh, I'm tired of this. Uh, no, it wasn't actually that. What The interesting part of it is it was actually back in 2003. And I read a book written by a Northeastern professor about the first World Series. And the first World Series was in 1903. And it was, the Buffalo, uh, it was the Boston Americans against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And in his book, he talks about how the Boston Americans actually were born in Buffalo and moved to Boston in 1901 at the dawn of the American League. So Buffalo was going to have an American League baseball franchise. They had paid the franchise fee. They were all ready to get started. And in January of that year, Ban Johnson, the American League president, needs felt he needed a team in Boston to compete with the National League's Boston Braves. So he moved the Buffalo franchise to Boston. They became the Boston Americans, won the first World Series in 1903, and in 1907 they were renamed the Boston Red Sox. 
So I was like, oh, okay, wait a minute. Buffalo, Boston connection. And then of course there's, I read the same year, the book of the curse of the Bambino. And it's like, okay, well, there's this Red Sox curse. And then later that year was the American League Championship Series that the Yankees won on a walk-off home run and beat the Red Sox in the 11th inning. And I'm like, oh my God, this like Boston curse is real. It's related to Buffalo. We've never won a universally recognized championship. So maybe there's something to this curse that's actually bigger in Buffalo than it is in Boston. And then I started researching. And the more I uncovered, the more I was convinced there's a curse. Where do we, where do we pinpoint the beginning of this curse? Because so many curses, you have a starting point. You have the curse of the Billy Goat with the Chicago Cubs. You have the curse of the Bambino, as you've mentioned. Um, where does this one begin? Is there any one place to pinpoint? Yes. Yeah, so it starts in 1901. And it starts with the Buffalo franchise moving to Boston in January of 1901. Later that year, President McKinley is assassinated at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo. And a month after that, the owner of the Buffalo baseball franchise that was going to join the American League died of a heart attack at 53 years old on Franklin Street at Crowley's Bar. His name was James Franklin. And many people who knew him said he died of a broken heart because he was shattered when they didn't get the American League team. So those three events happened all in 1901, and that's the beginning of the curse. So how does it end? Uh, how well, do we, hopefully uh... we win the Super Bowl <laughs> this year. <laughs> um, but the interesting part is I researched every professional sports team in Buffalo history in the four major sports. Buffalo uh, baseball, basketball, football, and hockey. And every one of those teams has at least one cursed event. And most have many, like the Bills and the Sabres. And it even affects teams that were almost Buffalo teams and then fell apart for some reason. What would be an example of that? So, for example, in the Continental Baseball League in 1959, William Shea was forming a, base, a professional baseball league to compete with the American and National Leagues because the New York Giants and um, the Brooklyn Dodgers had moved to the West Coast and Shea wanted a team in New York City um, to compete with. He didn't want to be a Yankees rooter. He wanted another team. And so he decided to form his own league. Buffalo was one of the original franchises in the Continental Baseball League. And they were going to begin play in 1961. So the league had all been formed in 1960. Actually, Ralph Wilson was a part owner of the baseball team. And then the, the Major League Baseball decided, oh, we don't want this league. So we're going to expand into New York and into Houston. And they gave William Shea a franchise that turns out to be the New York Mets. Well, after Shea gets his franchise, he doesn't need the new league. So the new league folds and Buffalo loses out. The interesting thing of those eight cities that were part of the Continental League, every one of them has a Major League Baseball franchise today, except Buffalo. Some would even apply to franchises that have left Buffalo. The Los Angeles Clippers are considered maybe a cursed basketball franchise because of the circumstances by which they left Buffalo in the late 70s. Correct, and I so I cover the Buffalo Braves. Um, and they have multiple cursed events, not only the move, uh, but also the famous game six in the 1974 playoffs. When, Jojo White. Yes, the, the phantom foul call at the end of the game. And then the Celtics go on and win the championship that year. I know I'm not phrasing this correctly, Greg, but what is your favorite curse moment? <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a pet? Do you have a pet uh, curse uh, example, or or maybe one that in your research you uh, you're particularly fond of because you were able to uh, do a deep dive into a a, a part of the curse that maybe uh, we don't think about nearly enough. Yeah, well, there's 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 probably two, both both related to football. One specifically to the Bills, of course. You know, they won the '64 and '65 AFL championships. 
But those were not universally recognized championships because the NFL was considered the superior league at the time. But in 66, they have a chance to go to Super Bowl one and they're hosting the Kansas City Chiefs in the AFL championship game at home. Near the end of the half, the Bills are trailing 14 to seven, driving for the tying touchdown in the red zone. Kemp goes back to pass. Bobby Crockett is free in the end zone. He throws the pass. Bobby Crockett slips on the muddy field. Johnny Robinson cuts in front, catches the ball, returns at 70 yards. Chiefs kick a field goal, go up 17-7 at halftime, and go on and win the championship instead of the game being tied 14-14 and the Bills having the momentum going into half. Of course, the Chiefs lost to the Packers, but many historians will tell you that the Bills were a much better matchup because we had a defense that had gone 17 consecutive games without allowing a rushing touchdown. What was Green Bay known for? Running the football. Um, So who knows? We might have won that elusive championship in the the very first Super Bowl no less right in the very first Super Bowl the other interesting one is many people don't know that we had an original franchise in the National Football League it was called the American Professional Football Association in 1920 in 1921 Buffalo had a team called the Buffalo All-Americans they went through what you would define as the regular season with an 8-0-2 record the best record in the league, the Buffalo newspapers crowned them NFL champions in in, in 1921. The owner decided he needed more money, so he agreed to play what he thought were two exhibition games, one against Akron and one against the Chicago Staley's. They beat Akron on a Saturday. They played Chicago the next day on a Sunday, who they had beaten two weeks earlier. They lost to them 10 to 7. After that game, George Hallis, who was the owner of the Chicago Staley's, said that the Staley's should be champions because if you included those two games, their record was 9-1-1 and and our record was 9-1-2. and So they had a better percentage. So he lobbies the owners in the spring of 1922 because there's no playoffs then. He lobbies the owners and they vote to make the Staley's NFL champions. It's known as the Staley Swindle. And the owner, Frank McNeil of the Buffalo franchise, fought with the NFL for the rest of his life, all the way up to 1961 until he died, to get that overturned and make Buffalo champions. Because of one extra tie. Because Because one of extra tie and because he played those two games. If he never plays those two games, Buffalo is the NFL champion. But back in those days, they were looking for, you know, hey, if we play, we'll get more money, right? For sure. Um, And he thought they were exhibition games. And back then it was like a college format where there was, uh, you had to decide uh, subjectively who the champion was. It it wasn't uh, through uh, any kind of tournament. No, right. There was no playoff games at that point. So, what about so those are two interesting ones here? Here's what I wanted to ask you about. And we're of course talking to Greg Tranter, the author of the Buffalo sports curse, 120 years of pain, disappointment, heartbreak, and eternal optimism. Uh, the book is available uh, online published by RIT press. Uh, just Google it and you can pull the trigger and purchase it right there or attend the book signing at RIT uh, on Wednesday from 1130 AM to 430 PM. Uh, Greg is going to be there with all the authors. Uh, who've written for RIT Press this year. Uh, Greg, uh, what about Joe Macy, the undefeated yes. and ranked number one uh, heavyweight contender? Again, a classic bit of Buffalo sports history that the guy had, didn't even lose. He was ranked number one, never got a shot at the title. And had he gotten a shot at the title, in my opinion, probably would have won because The top contenders or the different people in the WBC, I believe at the time, were quite beatable. Um, Yes. Where where does Joe Macy fit in the in the pantheon of of cursed sports moments in Buffalo? Yeah. So, of course, you know, baby Joe was undefeated um, and he was to fight in Las Vegas. His first fight in Las Vegas, um, he was fighting a Russian, Valislav Jarov, I think is how you say his name. Um, And if he won that fight, 
he was going to fight he was going to fight Mike Tyson at Ralph Wilson Stadium. They would have had we would have had 70,000 people at Ralph Wilson Stadium to see a, a boxing match. He he actually wins the fight against Gerard. He dominated the fight for about eight rounds. And then in the ninth round, he got hit in the back of the head by a rabbit punch from Giraffe. It stunned him. And even though he got knocked down a few times, he was able to finish the fight. He won the fight by unanimous decision. The next day after the fight, it was determined that he had a brain bleed. And therefore, he lost his license to box in Las Vegas and in many other states. And in essence, it ended his career. He did fight a few fights a few years later, but he never was able to fight that championship fight. He didn't get to fight Tyson. If he had won that fight, he would have fought for the heavyweight championship of the world. And like you said, could have very, very well won that. And instead, his career ends because of a rabbit punch to the back of the head. Is part of that curse the newspaper reporter that kept insistently reporting on that subdural hematoma and wouldn't let it die down and wouldn't let Joe Macy fight even though he still wanted to? Yeah, well, that didn't help him for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't ignore it. No, uh, that's right. I couldn't ignore it. It was an actual thing. Uh, he actually did get to keep fighting. But yeah, his inability to fight in Nevada and in the state of New York, because New York held held firm on its uh, uh, refusal to give him a license over that brain injury, really curtailed his career, his ability to make money. And so he had to fight in places like West Virginia and Puerto Rico, and I think Arkansas. And there were various places that he had to fight yeah. where he just could not make the money. And also the, the major sanctioning bodies aren't interested in holding their title belt um, fight on a, on an Indian reservation in Idaho. Um, right. They want to have it in Atlantic city or Madison square garden or Caesar's palace. Right. Uh, we haven't really talked about the Sabres, Greg, and I know that no goal is the most obvious. Is there, as you were mentioning, like the 1921 bills, do you have a Sabres example without giving away the entire book? Let's, I guess I don't want to just take you through the entire book and have people not bother buying it, but uh, do you yeah. have a, do you have a pet uh, Sabres curse? Well, yeah, 2006, um, you know, the Sabres have a great run. Uh, they get all the way to the conference finals. Um, while they get all the way to the conference finals game seven, they lose four defensemen to injury, two other key players to injury. So they were basically playing with the Rochester Americans defense, <laughs> with the exception of one or two players in game seven in Carolina. And they go into the third period leading two to one. Uh, it was really amazing. And then Carolina gets the tying goal. And then later in the third period, Brian Campbell tries to clear the puck out of the Sabres end and inadvertently clears the puck into the stands. Of course, a two minute delay of game penalty is called. And of course, Carolina scores the conference winning goal during that penalty. Carolina then goes on and wins the Stanley Cup. And arguably, if we had even had some of our defensemen, <laughs> we win that game. We were really the better team and lost. Yeah, I was uh, not only at the Vasily Girov fight against Joe Macy, I was at that game. Uh, I don't think you can blame me for all the curses, though. I, I didn't even work in Buffalo for uh, the Music City Miracle or uh, No Goal. Uh, that all happened right before I got here. Um, oh, I mean, there's so many others. And I, again, I don't want you to give away all the details, but I mean, you think of the very the ones off the top of your head, of course, are wide right and no goal. Uh, and I'm trying to bring up some other ones here. That's why I mentioned Joe Macy. Uh, but uh, you have Bob Lanier for St. Bonaventure uh, in the in the final four. I mean, I don't uh, Jonah, you seem to be uh, itchy. To... I did want to ask about that one. Bob Lanier injuring his knee. And where does that rank in the. Yeah, so I don't I don't cover that in the book because I focused on professional sports. So, of course, that's a college game. Um, it would be right up there, of course. Um, but I only focused on the four major professional sports. Um, Why do you think um, – because, you know, at some of the lower levels, the Bisons have won a championship, the Buffalo Bandits have won championships, some of the lower minor league teams have – maybe broken through and not been cursed. Why do you think the curse only applies 
you know, at the highest level with the most important teams in Western. New well, because that's where all the national publicity is, right? That's what would make Buffalo stand out. Um, and so I just think that, you know, Buffalo gets all kinds of, you know, negative press around, you know, weather and things like that. And it's, you know, an industrial was an industrial city and, you know, all that. And then you add the sports teams on top of it. And so to me, it's all about the national view of the city and our in the four major sports we've never won. It's also a, a reminder, a cruel reminder. No, I don't want to say a reminder because then that means I agree with it. It's a an emphasis that you are minor league and this is all you get. This is what you deserve. Yes, you get to have your minor league championships, uh, but Buffalo has long had that second city complex, that inferiority complex to Toronto or New York City that I do think that it's uh, it's it's almost like it's an extra twist of the knife that you are allowed to have these minor league championships. But that's yes. it. You're not going to get anything better than that. You can win the right. TBT. Remind you, uh, you know, this is a reminder of you know, stay in your place. You know, just you know, a nice pat on the head to all the folks in Buffalo and uh, enjoy your your AAA baseball World Series. Yes, right. And and I do talk, I do go through the book about how how Buffalo tried to get into the NFL for years and was always turned away for one reason or another. A fascinating part of Buffalo history, and it applies, obviously, to Buffalo sports history because it's on the site of Highmark Stadium, is the Sheldon Family Cemetery. A lot of people don't know about it, but right outside of Gate 7 at Highmark Stadium uh, is the Sheldon Family Cemetery plot, which was kind of, it was covered over by brush and, 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 and trees and things, and it wasn't until they cleared that spot, that 120 acres or so, to build the original rich stadium that they found this cemetery plot. Do you think that applies to the curse? Do you think that that's, uh, or was the curse already uh, too rooted uh, by, uh, by 1901 that the Sheldon family uh, cemetery isn't uh, that the fact that the bills play on a burial site, and it's also <laughs> believed it not even believed to be the plaque outside gate seven mentions that uh, it, there was an early uh eerie Indian village on that site. And there's believed to be uh, Native Americans uh, buried on that site also. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I think it was deeply ingrained before Rich Stadium. Uh, <laughs> well, this didn't help. <laughs> no, that's right. It, it certainly didn't. <sighs> uh, I think, didn't they have an event last year of trying to lift the curse? I think it was in January of this year. Uh, they had yeah. a a woman from the Six Nations uh, came across. She was uh, from Ontario, came over and did a. And there have been things like that over the years, right, Greg? Exorcisms, yes. priests oh, have yeah. been brought in, various you know, <laughs> uh, uh, clergy of all all stripes, uh, whether right. legitimate or not, uh, have tried to exercise this curse. What do you think needs? To, is there something that needs to be done other than breaking through? Does something need to happen before? But so a team can break through. Well, yeah. So which is part of the reason I felt I needed to publish the book. Now we have to acknowledge there's a curse before we can break it. And I think we're in denial that there is such a thing. There are some of us that believe it, but many don't. Um, and so and, and I, I and I think there's now more believers on Monday morning than there were on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> right. Have you heard of the Billy Buffalo curse? Uh, no. Well, no, that was one that was going around because the the introduction of the mascot Billy Buffalo coincided with uh, the season after a uh, home run throwback and the drought. You know, it was oh, and also oh. or the St. John Fisher curse uh, that was also calling it because once the Bills went to training camp at St. John Fisher, uh, they had uh, they didn't make the playoffs for almost two decades. Uh, yeah. Of course, Blue those curse. curses have been broken if they really did ever exist. Yep. No, this one's bigger and broader and longer. <laughs> and more, much more sinister. Yes, without a doubt. Okay. Well, Can so, I ask you, I, I don't know if it applies as a curse, but what do you think about as a, as a Buffalo sports historian, this era and episodes with Jack Eichel tanking seasons to, to draft a player like him, building the franchise around him and the way it ended? Is that How does that fit into the the history of cursed eras in Buffalo sports. Well, I mean, that to me, that actually goes back to, you know, 2008 
when the Sabres management completely misread the free agency market and you lost Daniel Briere and Chris Drury, which were the heart and soul of those 2006-2007 conference finals teams. And the Sabres have never recovered. And then, yeah, I mean, to me, when you, when you start tanking and lo- trying to lose intentionally to change that culture, the Sabres are still trying to change that culture um, and have had no success in doing so. It just, it gets Im- embedded, um, you know, and then, you know, here you, you know, I mean, you can argue about Jack Eichel, but, you know, he was supposedly a generational type player and then he gets injured and then we don't want to go along with whatever the medical stuff says. And we get in an argument and end up losing him. And, you know, maybe that'll turn out to be okay for us, you know, based on who we got in the trade, but he certainly looks, looks like he looked when his rookie year now. Looks like um, Jack Eichel. Yeah. So it just adds to it. Um, it definitely adds to it. And, you know, I mean, here the Sabres are, you know, they're trying to match the bills with length of uh, not making the playoffs. I mean, and in, in, in the national hockey league, it's almost impossible to go a dozen years without making the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> More than half the NFL teams record, make it. NHL record. Right. Nobody's ever done it. Right. I mean, so, so yeah, that's right. part of the curse for sure. All right, Greg, before we wrap it up here, let's then emphasize the final two words of, of the book title, eternal optimism. Uh, what are your encouraging thoughts here to Buffalo sports fans uh, heading forward as, uh, as they cope with uh, 120 years of, of being cursed? Well, I mean, you know, all you have to do is, you know, look at the bills. I mean, we have among the best rosters in the National Football League. And we have a generational quarterback who, yeah, he's had a couple of bad games. Uh, that happens. Um, you know, I'm, I'm banking on what happened two years ago. Two years ago, you remember, everybody remembers Hale Murray. And then the Bills didn't lose another game until the AFC championship game. Well, why won't they do the same thing this year? Um, they're good enough to do that. And they're good enough to go win a Super Bowl. Um, and hopefully they will. Uh, but, you know, Bill, Bill's fans, Sabres fans, we're always, every year, we're optimistic that our team's going to be good and it's going to win something. And one of these years, it's going to happen. And, you know, if we were talking two weeks ago, we would have been pretty confident that this could be the year. <sighs> or even last year, uh, you're going back to the game in Tampa Bay. Uh, the heartbreaking loss there against, and I can't believe we haven't said this name up until now, Tom Brady. Um, <laughs> but uh, we did make it a half hour without mentioning Tom Brady while the discussing the topic of Buffalo sports curse. But it was pretty uh, looked pretty dire after uh, losing yes. that game and probably feeling the same uh, that Bills fans are feeling uh, these last forty eight hours after the Vikings loss. Uh, and the Bills put it back together and got within, again, two Thirteen words. I did 13 seconds. seconds. <laughs> I'm getting back to the AFC Championship game. Oh, Lord. Um, Greg, do, thanks do for this. Things, and Oh, go ahead, wanna, Jonah. Do, does it get easier to deal with as the years and the cursed events go on and on, or does it get harder? How, how, do, you, how do you react to more recent uh, Buffalo sports heartbreaks compared to some of the ones that have happened years and years ago? Or well, so, I mean – I mean, 13 seconds. I mean, so I, I, I blame that on me, actually. So when we scored the go-ahead touchdown, I turned to my wife and I said, oh, my God, we're going to win. <laughs> and then, of course, we don't. <laughs> um, so, I mean, you know, it, the last two years have been really painful because we're right on the edge. I mean, and it's, uh, last year's, watching last year's Super Bowl was agony. We were better than both of those teams. I mean, we without a doubt, and here we are not playing. Um, so yeah, it's and and as I get older, it's like I just want one championship before I go. I mean, come on, <laughs> just one. You mentioned your wife real quick. I, I think I read in the Buffalo News article that before you got married, she went and saw a psychologist to consult whether uh, your sports fandom was, you know, a psychological condition or something like that. Yes, <laughs> yes, she did. <laughs> 
I'm happy yes. that worked out for you. <laughs> yes, whether whether it was whether this passion was a sickness or whether it was just a really good passion. <laughs> I remember that article. <laughs> yeah, at least you broke through that curse. Yeah, though I think she still questions it now and again. <laughs> Well, Greg, you're doing your part. You're doing all you can do. Uh, like you said, uh, awareness uh, is half the battle and writing this book uh, hopefully uh, does its part uh, in ending uh, the Buffalo sports curse for all those long suffering Bill Sabres fans out there. Uh, I, I'm rooting for you. Uh, I'm rooting for all the people in my life uh, who've been out there uh, waiting for a championship. And uh, I, I would be thrilled for them if it were to happen. The Buffalo Sports Curse, 120 years of pain, disappointment, heartbreak, and eternal optimism. And again, I want to plug this signing because it's not that far away. It's just in Rochester. Actually, it's in uh, Henrietta. Uh, there's a book signing Wednesday from 11.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at RIT. Uh, and it's not only Greg, but all the authors uh, who've uh, had books published by RIT Press uh, in 2022. They're all going to be there uh, signing their books. Um Greg, thanks for this, uh, and good luck with the book. And uh, hopefully, uh, it is a it's a history book uh, soon uh, for uh, for all those Bills fans out there. They can look back and see how it used to be uh, instead yes. of you needing to uh, add uh, kind of do uh, uh, additions. You know, I don't want this. I don't want this book to need a second edition, uh, let alone a third or a fourth. Yeah, no, I want the next edition to be how we overcame it. <laughs> <laughs> Greg Tranter, thanks so much. Thanks, Tim and Jonah. Thank you.